Huh? Oh, one was removed by the system, but okay, now the recording is done. All right. Okay. Okay, okay so we are delighted to have Professor Anish Gosch from the uh, Tata Institute, TIFR in Mumbai, um, as today's speaker. Um, his work is centered around ergodic theory, more precisely applications of ergodic theory to uh, problems in approximation. And um, I would like to mention that he received this year's Shanti Shvarup Badnaga Prize for his outstanding contributions to ergodic theory. Um, he will talk to us about um, the following topic is square root two very different from cube root of two okay so uh, thank you very much stefan for the kind uh, introduction and the invitation i'm very happy to be able to speak here um, at belur even though it's uh, virtual um so uh, as stefan said uh, i am an ergodic theorist and so this talk is just supposed to be an introduction to the broad theme of uh, how ergodic, what ergodic theory is and how it relates to other parts of mathematics, especially number theory. And if time permits, maybe we'll discuss some geometry. Now, uh, there's a couple of things I'd like to say. The first thing is that I can only see my slides, so I can't really see uh, anyone in the audience. So if you could, um, if you have any questions, please interrupt uh, whenever you like. Don't wait till the end. And uh, in particular, I can't read the chat. So it, it's much better if you just uh, interrupt me with your question. And so I'll try to answer it. OK. So the, the question is, uh, the question in the title is, is the square root of 2 very different from the cube root of 2? And uh, what I want to try to explain to you is that uh, somehow Diophantine properties of numbers are frequently very, very difficult to decipher. Okay, and so it's really quite embarrassing, but you know, it's still the year 2021 and we don't know much about uh, individual properties of numbers like pi or the cube root of two or, and so on and so forth. So uh, we ergodic theorists have been trying to use a kind of slightly different machinery to uh, attack these problems. Sometimes we're successful, sometimes we have not. So uh, my aim today is to try to give you some idea of how one might uh, use a subject like ergodic theory to study Diophantine approximation of numbers, OK? So the beginning, of course, is the question. Uh, one must begin with the question, what is this ergodic theory that you keep talking about, OK? Maybe you've never heard of it. It's absolutely fine. So uh, the etymology of the word is uh, from the Greek. It's a Greek origin word. And uh, formally or informally, it's somehow um, supposed to uh, be the mathematically rigorous study of chaotic systems, all right? So uh, this name, I think, was coined by the famous uh, Austrian physicist Ludwig Boltzmann, who was a pioneer in the study of gases, all right? So motion of gas molecules, okay? And uh, he... Um, Made an, he made a hypothesis, which was called the ergodic hypothesis. And that says the following. So now let's try to imagine that we want to predict the motion of a gas molecule, right? So all of us, when we were in school, we had these strange, uh, you know, but fun problems in physics, which says that, you know, one train leaves uh, one station at this time and goes at this speed, another train leaves another station at a slightly different time with a slightly different speed. When will they cross each other? Things like that. 
you know, nice applications of Newtonian mechanics, all right? So how do you solve these things? You idealize the problem and pretend that the trains are both point masses and that uh, the mechanics of the system is roughly you know, ideal. And then you, Newton has kindly given us a system of equations which model the motion of these two trains. And we can solve these equations and come to some conclusion about when these trains are going to cross, okay? That's how uh, life was in school. It was very nice. Now, um, if you're, you know, if you're in a situation where you have to do the same thing with a gas molecule, it's kind of a very different ball game because the motion is very energetic and very chaotic. So it's very, very uh, sensitive, for example, to the initial conditions. All right. So in principle, of course, one can hope that you can write down some complicated system of equations and solve it. But in practice, if I have to actually do it, it seems like a very daunting, almost impossible task. So what to do? So, uh, uh, you know, uh, what one does when one is faced with a situation where you can't measure something instantly is you try to measure it on average. Okay, You try to measure it over a longer period of time. And so this was uh, Boltzmann's uh, great idea, which is he said that uh, if you put a gas molecule in a closed uh, box or a closed room, then uh, he stated an ergodic hypothesis which says the following. Right? It's a beautiful hypothesis. It says, if you look at the trajectory, imagine you're looking at the trajectory of this gas particle. And you uh, you trace the trajectory and you trace it and go on and on. So you trace it for longer and longer periods, right? so longer and longer orbit. And uh, the hypothesis is that as the time that you're uh, measuring the orbit goes to infinity, the orbit distributes itself evenly across the room or the closed space, okay? So this is a mathematical statement. It says that on the left-hand side, there's a limit as t goes to infinity of an average over an orbit. So it's an integral of a nice function evaluated at the orbit of the gas molecule. And this particular left-hand side integral is our problem. It's very difficult to evaluate what is happening because the orbit is very chaotic. I don't know what to do. So Boltzmann said or hypothesized more precisely, that it doesn't matter if you can't uh, figure out the deterministic behavior of the gas molecule. On average, as the orbit gets longer and longer, the left-hand side, this complicated integral, will equal the integral of the function over the whole space. Okay? And that is some integral that all of us, you and I, can evaluate. Right? It's much easier to evaluate some integral of some nice function over a compact domain rather than uh, predict some complicated motion of a gas. Okay, So the message to take away from the ergodic hypothesis of Boltzmann is that for a so-called ergodic system, a time average is the same as a space average. The time average is usually what we're interested in, but can't co compute because it's too complicated. And the space average is the thing that uh, the time average limits towards and that we know how to compute. All right. So this was all happening in the 1800s. And at that point, you know, another, uh, some more serious contributors to this ergodic hypothesis were uh, Ehrenfest and Ehrenfest and so on. But at that time, there was one serious issue, which is that uh, the physics was, as usual, going faster than the mathematics. Okay, so uh, almost always mathematicians uh, tend to progress very slowly because we have to check all the small epsilon and deltas and we can't proceed. Whereas physicists, uh, the subject is such that they can try to progress based on, uh, you know, vision and hypothesis and so on. 
And this was no different. Basically, the right mathematics you need to study this kind of thing is measure theory. And measure theory was missing at the time. So one had to wait for a long time. So one had to wait till the 1930s when uh, simultaneously and independently uh, two great mathematicians, uh, Birkhoff and von Neumann, mathematically formalized uh, Boltzmann's ergodic hypothesis and proved the first ergodic theorems. All right. So that was that 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 event, the simultaneous publication of these two theorems, can be said to be the start of mathematical ergodic theory. Okay, so this is just a brief introduction to ergodic theory. Now let's start with the number theory uh, part of the talk. Are there any questions for the intro? So I, let me just emphasize once more that you know this is a talk where I'm I don't have any fixed goal, right? So there's no great theorem that I'm going to present. So I can wander around the place as much as we like. In particular, if you're not familiar with some term like uh, what is a measure or something, don't hesitate. Just ask, and we can talk about it. All right. Okay. So I have one question. Uh, yes. Uh, this ergodic theory is applicable uh, only to number theory, or is it applicable to other topics, other uh, fields also? Um, it's kind of a very. Uh, Okay, that's a very good question. So uh, let me answer, uh, you know, uh, in the following way. So yes, it is applicable to all sorts of um, different topics. Geometry is one big thing. But you know, the what I should say, and, and I really mean it, is that it's actually not very accurate to say that it's applicable because many times, there are results in number theory which help ergodic theorists and vice versa, right? So it's a subject which borrows a lot from various disciplines and contributes as well. That's the way to think about it. But the main um, kind of connections are with probability, with uh, geometry, you know, geometry and negative curvature, which we might come to if we have time, and uh, with the number theory. But there's also kind of uh, other very interesting connections, like, you know, for instance, um, nowadays a very fashionable topic is to do ergodic theory on the so called uh, uh, flat surfaces, namely this uh, landmark work of Eskin Mirza Khani and so on. And that has uh, connections to a wide variety of other topics, like serious connections to algebraic geometry, serious connections to physics, um, you know, volumes of various moduli spaces which have come up in physics. So in that sense, a lot of, um, it's a big subject. I mean, I think, you know, uh, about say 50 years ago or something, uh, what, you know, what people thought traditionally as uh, constitutes ergodic theory and what people today think ergodic theory is, is very different. So it's kind of, uh, it's it, it started off as a small tent and now it's becoming bigger and bigger and bigger. And uh, it's just another instance of the fact that, uh, which I always believe, which is that, you know, if you do a good piece of mathematics, it will get connected to other good pieces of mathematics. Did that answer your question? Yes, absolutely. And one question also about the, I mean, uh, maybe I should ask at the end of the talk, but the question is that uh, what is the, I mean, uh, if someone gets to, wants to get a, I mean, a general overview of this uh, ergodic theory, what is the flavor of this theory, what are, I mean, what are the most essential things? What is any book or any, um, I mean, any reference you would like to suggest? to people who are not very much, I mean, into this area, that they just want to get a feeling of what sort of, uh, I mean, what sort of, uh, I mean, um, um, yeah, of course, sort of subject. 
That's a great question. If it's okay with you, I'll address it at the end, right? Oh, yes, that's fine. Absolutely. Because that's a very good point. Let me make a note of it. Uh, because I'm sure your talk will also go a long way in um, and, uh, I mean, giving some idea of what this is uh, about. No, that's a great question. I'll, I'll be happy to um, answer it at the end. And uh, also, I, um, two things, like one thing which is, since I can't see anybody, if you just uh, tell me who you are, it will be nice just to have some... I'm, I'm Ashish Gupta. I'm basically an algebraist. I'm I see, I see. department. Very, uh, very nice. Very nice to meet you, Ashish. Thanks uh, for the my, question. My video, actually, my computer... I mean, we have to restart it to get the video on. So I will I do so in a moment. I didn't want to miss the talk, so I didn't restart the computer. No, that's absolutely fine. In fact, even if your video was on, I wouldn't be able to see you because I can only see my own screen. All right, thank you very much, Ashish. I'll, I'll answer this at the end for sure. Thank you. So can you, uh, please Can you say that again? I didn't catch you. I'm so I'm fine. I'm thankful to your okay, okay, answer. Thanks. 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 Cool. Great. All right. So this was my spiel about uh, what ergodic theory is. And so now let's uh, go to the other end of the spectrum and look at what number theory is. Okay. So all of us know, uh, everybody knows that pi is actually a rational number and equals 22 by 7. I'm just joking, but <laughs> you know, that's if you took a national poll, I think the 22 by 7 would win over pi. But we know that it's a good approximation to pi, right? So uh, the reason is that uh, every real number has uh, what is called a continued fraction expansion. Okay, so many of us have seen this, but let's just have a look at what it is. So here's a continued fraction expansion for pi. This is a symbolic notation. This is uh, the string of numbers is meant to encode uh, this kind of uh, continued fraction. All right. So all of us have seen uh, how to uh, things like this before. And we know that this is a very powerful tool to study real numbers. Okay. So many properties of real numbers can be read I off Hi, Anish. Uh, I, Sir, I can see the title page. Are you, sorry? I can only see the title page. Uh, are you uh, that, changing the slide? Yeah, the same with me. Same with me. Oh, that's not good. Page. That is not good. I have changed the slide. Uh, now now we can see. Yes. Now you can see it? Yes. All right. So maybe I'll just. I had a full screen on. Maybe I shouldn't have a full screen on. So uh, this is okay. I'm just going to scroll. All right. It, is, it looks yeah, fine. Yeah, it's fine. Yeah. Yeah. All right, cool, cool. Mm -hmm. So I'll scroll. It'll just be a bit slower, but at least you can see. So here's the continued fraction expansion for pi. And these entries in the continued fraction expansion, they're called partial quotients. All right. So basically, the fact is that you can read off rational approximations uh, to pi by look, truncating the continued fraction expansion of pi. Right? So, and this is a very powerful tool um, to study uh, to study uh, the Diophantine properties of a number like pi. For example, uh, you can look at the continued fraction expansion of the square root of two, right? which is just uh, one followed by a bun uh, bunch of twos. That's it, all right? And so you might ask yourself, well, uh, this looks like a very particular kind of continued fraction expansion. Does it mean anything? And indeed, you'd be right in thinking that it might mean something. It means uh, it's a almost, it's a characterization of a particular property of the square root of two. Namely, that a number is a quadratic irrational if and only if its continued fraction expansion is eventually periodic, right? So this is a periodic continued fraction expansion. And it turns out that this periodicity characterizes the property of being a quadratic irrational number, OK? So that's great, all right? So that's that's a, a feature of numbers which 
is completely characterized by looking at continued fraction expansions, something which we can uh, try to work out, right? So uh, let, this brings me to the first result of the day, which is a theorem of Dirichlet called the pigeonhole principle. Okay, so the theorem is exactly this picture. As you can see over here, the theorem is the following. There are one, two, three, nine holes, nine boxes, and there are 10 pigeons. So the theorem says, that if there are nine boxes and 10 pigeons, then at least one box must have at least two pigeons. Okay, that's the theorem, all right? And uh, the nice number theoretic corollary of this is a statement that every real number, every real number has a certain good approximation by rational numbers in the following precise way, namely, for every real number x and every integer n, there is a rational number p over q whose denominator is bounded above by n with the property that p over q is not very far from x. And this not very far is measured using the denominator of the rational. Okay, so this is precisely this theorem here. Uh, let me just keep it at the theorem. Right, so it says that there's a, for every real number x, you can find a corollary of this would be for every real number x, you can find infinitely many rationals p over q, such that x minus p over q is at most one over q squared, okay? So every real number has good rational approximations in this precise quantitative sense, all right? So I had a slide about the sketch of the proof, but I'm going to leave that because this is something that everybody knows how to do. And if you haven't seen it before, you should just uh, try to work it out. It's a fun exercise, okay? It's just uh, apl applying the pigeonhole principle in the only way possible, okay? So uh, what, what the previous slide said was that every uh, real number has good approximations in some precise sense. Now, the bad news is that there are numbers where, uh, for whom, um, which are in some concrete sense, badly approximable numbers, okay? What does it mean? So it means there are numbers like, uh, which are defined in the following, which satisfy this following, inequality that uh, they repel rational numbers. Namely, there is a constant depending on this number such that alpha minus p over q is always at least this constant over q squared. Okay, so we know from the previous slide that alpha minus p over q less than or equal to one over q squared has infinitely many solutions. For these badly approximable numbers, which are special numbers, the reverse inequality is also true with a small, a constant smaller than one, obviously. Okay, all right. So it turns out that uh, an example is given by our good friend, the square root of two from two slides ago, okay? The square root of two is an example of a badly approximable number, all right? So, uh, you know, going back to the question that uh, Ashish asked about how things are connected. So this property of being badly approximable actually turns out to be very important in um, a branch of uh, dynamics or in physics called uh, KAM theory, named after Kolmogorov, Arnold, and Moser. And this theory tells you, uh, for example, how, you know, it tells you about planetary motion and uh, how, uh, you know, how to set, send the satellite up to a precise point and so on and so forth. And uh, these numbers, numbers which are badly approximate by rationals play a very special role in the analysis of this kind of uh, problem, okay? 
So there's a good story about this, which maybe I'll I'll tell you the next time you call me. Uh, but it's a long story, so I'll, I'll, I won't say that now. Anyway, all right. So square root of two is an example of a badly approximable number. And uh, in fact, just like being a quadratic irrational was characterized by a by a property of continued fractions, being badly approximable is also characterized by a property of continued fractions, namely alpha is badly approximable if and only if it has bounded partial quotients in its continued fraction expansion, all right? So if you look at the continued fraction expansion of the number, then there's a universal uniform bound for the partial quotients. And this property characterizes being badly approximate. Okay, so that's another property which a continued fraction expansion can, you can read off a continued fraction expansion. All right. So these numbers, uh, it turns out, are not so many. So they have a zero measure. Is everyone happy with the concept of measure? All right, maybe let me rephrase by asking, is anybody unhappy with the concept of measure? I'm happy to give a two minute intro to it if you want. Yes, right. sir, it will. Yes, yes, yes. Sir, please give it. Please give it, sir. It's okay. Introduction. All right, all right, absolutely. Happy to do so, all right? So basically, as far as this talk is concerned, we want to be able to measure the size of various subsets of the line or the plane or Rn, okay? So the usual way to do this is to think of, uh, you know, if you have very nice uh, looking subsets like intervals or something, then you know how to measure the length of an interval, right? That's fine. But uh, you could have more complicated subsets, like a good example is to look at, say, you know the length of uh, interval between 0 and 1 is 1, because you declare it to be 1. But what about uh, the size of the set of rational numbers inside that interval? Are there lots of them? Are there very few of them? How to... Uh, measure this set, right? So, so basically, uh, mathematicians, uh, notably Lebesgue, uh, developed a comprehensive theory of how to assign a size to uh, a fairly large class of subsets of uh, the real line or Rn. Okay, and uh, the way I like to explain it, if I'm given only two minutes is uh, it's kind of a microscope, right? So basically, if you have a nice, uh, well-behaved big set, like an interval or something, then you can see it with your, real, uh, with your own eyes. If you have um, a more complicated set, which isn't quite visible to you, you take your microscope, adjust it a little bit to the right setting, and Lebesgue will tell you what the setting is. And then that setting determines the size of the set. Okay, so under Lebesgue's uh, microscopic microscope theory, rational numbers or countable sets have zero measure. Okay. All right. The interval has uh, length one, uh, zero one, zero two has length two. The rational numbers have zero measure. This is a very powerful theory. It also is, you know, it's a theory of integration. It's very powerful. But it has one flaw, which is that uh, it can't distinguish in on a finer scale. Okay, so here's an example of uh, something that Lebesgue can't distinguish. Uh, take the middle third Cantor set, right? So you know how it is, right? You remove, you chop up, you divide the interval into three parts and remove the middle and continue this iterative process. And you end up with an uncountable set. 
Okay. Now, Bex uh, theory, this uncountable set also will have zero measure. Okay, it's negligible in the scale of Lebesgue, in the scale that Lebesgue invented, both the rational numbers, which are a countable set, and this Cantor set, which is an uncountable set, both are negligible. So uh, we need a way to distinguish between these two. And uh, a beautiful way of doing so was invented by Hausdorff. So this is a finer microscope than Lebesgue's microscope, it's even finer. So you take a more powerful microscope and look into it, adjust it according to how Mr. Hausdorff tells you to, and at a certain adjustment, you will see the Cantor set, but you will not be able to see the rational numbers, okay? And this, num this uh, adjustment is a number given to the Cantor set, and it's called the Hausdorff dimension of the Cantor set. And it turns out for the middle third Cantor set to be log two by log three. Okay, so what Hausdorff did was give a notion of dimension which need not be integral and which allows us to distinguish the sizes of objects which are invisible to us. All right, so the rational numbers have zero Hausdorff dimension, the middle third Cantor set has Hausdorff dimension log two by log three. Okay, so the takeaway message is. Measure and dimension are two tools used to determine what the relative sizes of mathematical objects are. And the dimension is a finer scale than the measure. That's it, okay? So coming back to these badly approximable numbers, it turns out that they have zero measure, they're negligible, but in fact, their house of dimension is the highest possible, it's one, okay? The dimension of the line. So in another sense, in the sense of Hausdorff dimension, there's a big set, all right? All right. And so now comes the embarrassment uh, to all mathematicians, which is that we absolutely have no idea whether any algebraic number of degree greater than two is badly approximable or not. So going back to the title of my talk, namely, what is the difference between the square root of two and the cube root of two? The answer uh, to my embarrassment is I just, I don't know, right? That's the, that's the talk. The talk is, I don't know the difference. I'd love to know, but it seems that uh, to be a very difficult problem. We don't know how to check. We don't know how to check whether any algebraic number of degree greater than three Greater than two is badly approximate. All right, so this is the intro. Now I'm going to try to explain how the ergodic part of the introduction and the number theory part uh, get together and to form a mutually beneficial partnership. So there's exchange on both sides. Okay, are there any questions? All right, so uh, since uh, I'm running a little bit late on time, I'm going to skip a few slides, okay? Uh, if you want, I can send you the slides later and you can have a look at them. But I'm going to skip these two slides just for now and I'll come back to them later. All right, so uh, now we want to connect this uh, ergodic theory and this number theory. So how to do it, right? So. The idea is very simple. The idea is that uh, I have a very complicated number theory problem. What I'm going to try to do is build a model, build a space and build a dynamical system on this space and try to model the behavior of the number using my dynamical system, right? So, it sounds kind of strange the first time you hear it, but as we will see, it's not so uh, far-fetched an idea, okay? All right, so what is a dynamical system? Uh, we are going to uh, define by example, okay? So the, 
the motto is that uh, I'll give you some example of dynamical systems, and then when you encounter another one, if it looks and smells like one of the things I presented, then it's a dynamical system. That's it. Okay. So the first one is a very simple system. Uh, it consists of a topological space, namely the torus, the quotient of the real line by the integers, accompanied by a map of the torus to itself. And this map is very simple. It's called the times two map. Okay, so it's it's defined as follows. You take a number, you multiply it by two. Now, if you take a number in the unit interval zero, one, and multiply it by two, it might go out of the unit interval. And so you have to, in order to make it a map of the torus, you have to go mod one, All right? So that's what you do. You send x to two x mod one, and you iterate, right? So remember, in ergodic theory, you're looking at long-term behavior and so here, the orbit is the iteration of this map, repeated iteration, okay? This is an example of a dynamical system. A more, um, complicated example of a dynamical system, which is uh, important for our purposes, is obtained in the following way, all right? So, Remember this uh, torus example. So the torus is a quotient of the real line by integers, right? So uh, it's a quotient of a group, namely the real line, by a discrete subgroup, namely the integer. Okay, and it turns out that this process of taking quotients of groups by discrete subgroups is a very general kind of phenomena and is very useful in many contexts, okay? So today what we're going to do is we're going to look at the quotient, we're going to look at the group of two by two matrices with real entries and determinant one. That is this object called SL2R. And we're going to take the quotient of this by a discrete subgroup which is the same matrices, but now with integer entries, okay? So this object is called SL2Z, and it's exactly analogous to the torus situation, right? So you should think of this as some non-abelian torus, okay? It will be compact. Will it be compact, this question? That's a good question, and the answer is no. Uh, in fact, uh, that's a very good point. This uh, quotient is not compact. However, uh, it's still, so compactness is uh, the property of being small, right? So compact things are small and manageable. So this uh, quotient is also small, not in a topological sense, but in a measure theoretic sense in the following uh, what I mean is the following. It turns out that just as we were discussing the notion of measure on the real line and so on, groups such as SL2R also have their own notion, natural notion of measure, okay? So there's a natural measure on SL2R, on two by two matrices with determinant one, there's a natural measure. And this natural measure descends to this quotient. And when it descends to the quotient, it, be, it gives finite volume to the quotient, okay? So in other words, this quotient is not compact, but it is a probability space. So in the category of topological spaces, it's not small, but in the category of measure theoretic spaces, it is small. That, that's very evident. So I think you are talking about hard measure. So hard talking? measure, yes, yes. Hard measure. Okay, so uh, on this space, which is uh, more complicated than the circle of the torus, but not much more complicated, 
there is an analog of this times two map, which is an action by a diagonal matrix. I've called this diagonal matrix GT over here. And uh, it's just a diagonal matrix with entries e to the t, e to the minus t. Okay, so it's an embedding, it's a copy of the multiplicative line r minus zero. And this copy of the line is acting on this quotient simply by left multiplication. Okay, so an element here is a coset of SL to Z. It's little g times SL to Z, where little g is a matrix in SL to R. And I'm just going to multiply on the left by a matrix, this matrix, to get a dynamical system and iterate this dynamical system. Here, uh, do we not need to show that uh, the, I mean, the bottom group is invariant under this uh, action of uh, I mean, e to the t of this um, multi multiplicative real line? So to show that there is an action on the question, uh, will we not, because we are just taking left multiplication, so to yes. show that action descends on the question, do we not wish to, we need to show that the, I mean, the, I mean, this denominator in the question, this is uh, stable under the action of this uh, multiplicative real No, 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 it's not, it's not, it's not. See this, uh, I'm just saying that I take uh, some representative over here, say little g times SL to Z, and left multiply by g. So there's no question of uh, showing that. Uh, but how uh, would you ensure that uh, this is independent of the choice of a representative? So if I take another representative for the same right. set process, then right. how will I ensure the action is well defined? I, mean, uh, that I can also take another representative and multiply it by this. Uh, by this uh, no, see, the thing is, uh, how to explain it? The thing is that uh, I'm. I wish I could write. All right, so let me let me um, explain another way, right? So let's think about this in another way, right? So let me try to build a picture of this, and then maybe it becomes clear. So uh, instead of looking at this quotient in this way, let us look at uh, SL two R acting on lattices in R2. Okay. Okay, so what's a lattice in R2? Uh, it's just a discrete subgroup of finite uh, with uh, compact quotient. So one example of this would be Z2. Yes. Right? Yes. So and so SL2 R is acting on this. Yes, SL2R acts on a lattice right. in R2 just by multiplication on individual vectors right okay so this has the property because the matrices acting have determinant one when you act like this it uh, preserves the volume of the fundamental domain of the lattice that's right right so that's if right. you so... if you act by uh, a matrix in sl2r you can you'll get a different matrix you get you get a different lattice but the different lattice will have the same property that the fundamental domain has area one uh, i see so this question is representing a space of some kind of i mean some kind of objects like lattices exactly, and the right, exactly. On those. so now coming back to what you were saying exactly exactly right so what happens is you can check that the action is transitive and moreover, that Z2 is fixed by SL to Z. Uh, Z2 is fixed by SL to Z. That's correct. Yes. yes. Correct. So you can identify the quotient SL to R by SL to Z with the space of unimodular lattices in R2. Let's see. Okay. That's very, yes. That's very, that's very good point. So I understand you. So basically, um, so these are unimodular um, volume one lattices in, um, in, in, R, in R square. Yes, that's right. Yes. These are unim co volume one lattices in R2. And I'm taking one of these co volume one lattices 
and uh, moving it around using a dynamical system. Okay, okay. that's fine. That's great. Thank you so much. So there's a geometric interpretation of this, uh, which is based on interpreting SL to R by SS factor SL to Z as the unit time bundle of the modular surface. But I'm not going to go into that because um, of time constraints. But uh, let me just show you the picture, which many of us have seen. It's uh, uh, lifted from Wikipedia. And this is a picture of this quotient. It's supposed to be a picture of this quotient, namely uh, this shaded part. And it's not supposed to cut off here. It's supposed to go all the way up. The shaded part is a visual representation of SL to R factor SL to Z. It's a similar kind of uh, discussion that we were just having with Ashish, so, but the so action is are, different. Yeah, so you are doing this on the complex on the complex plane, this picture? This is the uh, upper half plane, yes. yes. Okay. This is the upper half plane. And uh, this is the basically fundamental domain for uh, the This is the, basically the fundamental domain for SL to Z. Um, I think I've come across it earlier, but I mean, I still have to go over the details to um, absolutely get myself um, sure right. about it. But I can make sense of it. I can make right. sense of it. So I'm, I'm just going to take a one second break and turn my lights on. Okay, that's okay. All right, I'm back. So now uh, this is the modular surface, and it's it's. Let's not worry about it. Maybe some other time. Okay. So this is the kind of discussion that we were just having, namely that uh, SL to R factor SL to Z, or more generally, SL N R factor SL in Z, can be identified with the space of co-volume one lattices in R n, all right. Now uh, it comes the connection between uh, Diophantine approximation and uh, dynamics on this space. So as was observed uh, earlier, the space is not compact, all right. And you know, if you think about this as a space of lattices, it's easy to see it's not compact because you can have very, very long uh, vectors in your lattice, provided you have a corresponding very short vector as well. So the only thing you need to be careful about is that the co-volume has to be one, all right? So, and this means that you can have uh, lattices with unbounded vectors, okay? There's a beautiful theorem by Mahler, which is called Mahler's compactness criteria, and it tells you exactly when a subset of the space of lattices is compact. So now comes the important bit. This is a connection between uh, Diophantine approximation of real numbers and dynamics on this space, right? So namely, you start with a real number x and associate to it a two by two matrix. So here I've tried to do a n by n thing, but ignore it. Let's assume that this id over here is also one, okay? So this is a two by two matrix, one x zero one. So if x was a square root of two, this would be the matrix one square root of two zero one and so on, all right? So starting with the real number, I produce a two by two matrix. And using this two by two matrix, I produce 
a point on SL2R factor SL2Z, namely, I take this two by two matrix and multiply all the vectors in Z, okay? This is a fixed matrix, UX. I multiply all the vectors in Z2 with it. So this is a upper triangular matrix. It's going to shear Z2, right? It's going to shear it. So when you shear it, you get a new lattice. You get a new lattice, which is on this space. And as X varies, you get a curve, curves worth of these lattices. So as X varies in the real line, you, you trace out a curve in the space of lattices by shearing, all right? In any case, when I fix X, if I fix X, then I get a fixed point in the space of lattices, namely this lattice UXZ2. <clears throat> and it turns out I can read Diophantine properties of X from, by taking this point, this lattice associated to X and moving it around by this diagonal matrix that I had on the previous slide. Okay, so uh, the diagonal matrix was uh, e to the t e to the minus t. I take this fixed x, produce a fixed lattice in the space of lattices, and now allow this, move this lattice around using the diagonal matrix as t varies. Okay, so I have like a complicated uh, uh, trajectory described by this dynamical system. And the uh, surprising thing is that uh, uh, you can study the motion of the dynamical system and it might tell you something about X. And for example, it's a result of Dani, of SG Dani, that the number is badly approximable. Remember we spoke about badly approximable numbers like the square root of two. A number is badly approximable if and only if when you take the number and produce this lattice and move it around by this diagonal guy, you get a bounded orbit, okay? So there is a compact subset of the space of lattices and this orbit is not allowed to move out of it, okay? And not only is, uh, so this is also like uh, previous uh, times, this is also a characterization of the Diophantine property, all right? This is an if and only if statement, okay? So similarly, uh, the famous uh, mathematician Fustenberg, uh, who won the Abel Prize along with Margulis, both, both Margulis and Fustenberg are giants in this particular field and very influential. So Fustenberg has a concrete conjecture about uh, whether the cube root of two is badly approximable or not in terms of a dynamical system. Unfortunately, the conjecture seems to be very hard and is still open. But um, let me finish my talk here. Uh, I had a few more slides which I'll send to you. So let me finish my talk here by uh, saying that the fact is that the continued fraction expansion that I described in the first few slides is a very powerful tool, but sometimes uh, it may not be enough. Another uh, sticking point is that there is not a good continued fraction expansion in higher dimensions. And ergodic theory is trying to uh, provide good models, good substitutes, for uh, more complicated Diophantine phenomena. But in doing so, we've discovered that this traffic goes both ways. Frequently, there are some beautiful number theoretic results which tell us about ergodic theory as well. All right, I think with that, my time is almost up, so I should uh, stop. Okay, thank you very much for your beautiful talk. Um, yeah, maybe we should invite you again, and um, I think there's still a lot to talk about. Uh, yes, Latin. I'd be happy to. Yeah. Okay. Um, are there any questions? Mm. 
Yes, there was one question I posed to Anish uh, that what were what what would be a uh, reference for this? Ah, yes, yes, that's a very good question. Um, so there's a graduate text in mathematics called Ergodic Theory with a View Towards Number Theory by uh, Manfred Einziler and Thomas Ward. So that's a good uh, book, right? Uh, it's a good book. Um, so another thing is that uh, a lot of this stuff has uh, basically been blogged on by Terry Tao. So if you're looking for small uh, pieces of material, not necessarily whole graduate text in mathematics, then Terry Tao's blog is, uh, as always, an excellent source of material. So for example, he has a course where he uh, explains how this kind of uh, Ratner theory, it's called Ratner theory, works and what it has to do with uh, Diophantine approximation and so on. And uh, there are some other sources, right? So there's a, a guy, there's a mathematician called Dave Vitti Morris. So his name is W I T T E M O R R I S. And uh, he uh, has some excellent expository words okay, on his website. In particular, he's written a book called Ratner's Theorems. It's a Chicago University Press book. And it's also a very good introduction to this kind of thing. And uh, if something else comes to mind, I'll maybe send an email. So this is basically, I mean, the connection is with the orbits. I mean, uh, the orbits, like you said, that uh, if the, the, the orbits are bounded in some sense, then you get um, I mean, it reflects in the properties of the real numbers. Yes, yes. So basically, so, it's an example of the situation. So. Uh, you know, you can you, if you have a divergent orbit that also is uh, character that also characterizes another Diophantine property. So it's kind of a dictionary. Yes, um, it's a dictionary which has Diophantine properties on one side and ergodic properties on the other, and uh, you can try to mix and match. Sometimes you know it doesn't make the problem easier, but sometimes it does make the problem easier. So, so I mean, have, uh, do you, um, I mean, have some, I mean, uh, kind of a notion why, I mean, these Diophantine properties get, um, I mean, um, get reflected, I mean, get resounded in this uh, setup of a uh, dynamical system, um, I mean, this particular setup of a dynamical system, what is the reason behind this, that this is, this is echoing the number theoretic, um, I mean, Diophantine, um, properties of numbers. I mean, is there any insight to it? Do you, you uh, know? Yes, right. So basically, uh, usually the reason is that there's some, uh, so what, what did we do, right? So we wanted to study something and we built a, a dynamical system. Now the choice of dynamical system has a lot of role to play in whether we can say something. Right, so you know, for example, um, this uh, proof that I presented of uh, or the theorem of uh, the pigeonhole principle of approximation, this uh, fact, the statement also admits the proof using lattices. So it's a corollary of Minkowski's convex body theorem. I see. So it has got initial. I mean, it's. The seeds are already, the roots are already there in Minkowski. Minkowski. Absolutely. The roots of this particular kind of thing are already there in the subject of geometry of numbers, which was pioneered by Minkowski. And this is the general fact about all ergodic approaches to number theory. You have to have some reason. So, for example, if you want to study quadratic forms, <coughs> then you can study it using ergodic theory provided the orthogonal group of the quadratic form plays a role in the dynamical system. So, uh, you know, on a practical note, there, uh, the system has been built to reflect the number theory. 
but the the beauty of it is that uh, having done this uh, having built the system it turns out you can say a lot about it so so I mean you mean the idea is a general one i mean even you can study other other objects by means of this the same yes the, the idea is a very general one and it has it has many many there are many examples of this particular idea this is only one instance it's a very general idea and it has to basically uh, do with the you know sort of a meta statement which says that we've tried to find some symmetry in your number theoretic problem and use that symmetry in constructing the number theoretic problem sorry uh, which problem you mentioned the number theoretic problem yeah you find try to find some feature or some symmetry in the number theory Yeah. and transport the symmetry to an ergodic setting and uh, this transport so there are you know two or three issues first of all you have to be able to build a system that is a good reflection of the number theory the second of all you have to be able to say something about this new system using uh, whatever tools you have at your disposal and third of all after saying something on the ergodic side you have to translate it back to the number theory side without losing information so, so that's basically the process so what i mean this is a personal question more of personal question but yes. what kind of setup dynamical setup is used to study for example the quadratic forms so for the quadratic forms uh, you know suppose you want to study values taken by a quadratic form in say three okay. variables right yes yes so you take an indefinite form in three variables you want to study its values yeah. uh what an ergodic theorist would do is uh, so suppose i want to study integer values of a quadratic form what i would do is so in this particular case that we just discussed we looked at the moduli space of all lattices right okay here for the quadratic form i would look at the moduli space of all quadratic forms so if i look at all determinant one quadratic forms they would be the quotient of sl3r by uh, so21 if i take signature 21 right uh, sl3r by sl2r so21 so21 okay actually so21 is almost sl2r so you are not wrong but uh, by so21 because it's the stabilizer of uh, an indefinite quadratic form in, of signature 21 Yes. So this space would parameterize quadratic forms, and I would act by SL to SL three Z on this space, and try to again have a dictionary which says that something about the quadratic form will come out of looking at the SL three Z orbit of a point in the moduli space of all quadratic forms. So the values the quadratic form will assume, I mean the yes. values that will come out from the quadratic form. They will be reflected from this. From this they system. will be reflected from this exactly. exactly. So, uh, which uh, which people do this kind of things? You uh, you know this? I mean, who studies quadratic forms? Uh, uh, well, the uh, the famous people are Dani and Margolis, and Eskin, and Moses, but there are also less famous people like me, for instance, who also do this kind of thing. Okay, so maybe that there will be some. request man from my side to i mean give some more enlightenment on this topic because yeah, i'm very happy much to value of what the forms can do i am always happy to yes. talk so uh, i'll be happy at some point to talk about it okay so i am i'm done with my questions i'm very really thankful for your answers. thank you thank you yeah thank you very much yeah it would be very nice to continue this talk to get sure, some sure. more details um yeah it's a big topic of course um maybe one question from my side yes, is there any please. is there any progress on this uh, problem of uh, if a uh, cube root of 2 is so uh, no no basically no so there was some there's been progress on the ergodic side but none of it is uh, making any contribution to this cube root of 2 yet <laughs> i see so it's still yeah. stuck i mean it seems to be very complicated 
Okay, but there is some hope uh, on the ergodic side to get. Uh, yeah, there is progress. definitely some hope. Mm -hmm. It's possible. It's possible. Okay. It just needs some new idea. Okay. But it's not. Uh, I mean, it's not completely out of question that someone will do. Oh, that sounds good. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. Um, are there other questions? Um, I had one question. Yes, yes. So actually, in the abstract, uh, you said, you know, it's a chaotic dynamical system. Uh, right. What I mean, could you say something about the chaotic, uh, what do you mean by... Uh, right, right. That's a good point. So uh, for me, um, chaotic is going to uh, be replaced by ergodic. And what I mean by ergodic is something which is kind of, um, so for example, if you take uh, this times two map or this diagonal flow on the space of uh, lattices, these are all ergodic systems and they're kind of chaotic in the sense that almost every orbit on the space is dense. So there's a lot of variety of orbits, a lot, almost every orbit is dense, but then, some orbits have very specific behavior, they're bounded. So there's a wide variety of um, behavior. So that's what I loosely call uh, chaotic. I mean, I, there, in, the, in the actual physics literature, there are definitions of chaotic, but I didn't mean it in that sense. Mm -hmm. I mean, a short answer is, I actually meant ergodic, but it doesn't look so, look so good in abstract. <laughs> okay, are there further questions? If not, you can also write an email, I think. Or... Yes, please, I'm happy <laughs> yeah. to answer emails anytime. Please write. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, if not at the moment, then let's Let's thank the speaker again for a very beautiful talk. Thank you very much. About a really attractive um, and very active uh, research area. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes. OK. Hmm? Bye. OK, then thank you very much. Bye. And bye to everyone. We will have a talk next week. And I will, yeah. OK, yeah, see you again soon. Hmm? Bye. Bye-bye.